the Lipper Scholar versus Jesus in Isaiah 53, verse 11. The speaker is God. Out of his anguish, he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion. My righteous servant makes the many righteous. It is their punishment that he bears. That would be the same as Ezekiel. He bore the punishment of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which was part of God's fire of refinement in preparing him to be a prophet to the Assyrian Babylon, Babylonian exiles. This reference to his uh, devotion is to chapter 11, verse 2 of Isaiah, where one of the attributes of the Spirit that alights upon the anointed one, Mashiach, is a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. The anguish is the emotional and physical pain. <clears throat> Ezekiel, for instance, suffered by punishment and the power of God to be made suitable for his purpose which, in my case, might prosper. God's righteous servant, that is, Demoshiach and myself, when I come out of God's fire of refinement and the anguish of it, and there's been plenty, I am very devoted to God. I'm devoted to the Jewish people. I'm devoted to the country of Israel. This is, this is my whole world, my whole focus, as though this is why I was born. As the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse. It says that he will make the many righteous by his knowledge. Knowledge, a Gentile such as myself, must be taught not only of the scripture, but of the Jewish people and their history, the Middle East, Israel, its government, and just anything and everything that I might need to know. Abraham, a stranger in a strange land of a strange language. That's a repeat for me. And just as Ezekiel was given knowledge in his fire of refinement, and this is where you find it, it's in, um, well, I don't have the chapter. God said to Ezekiel, Mortal, eat what is offered you, eat this scroll, and go speak to the house of Israel. That's teaching him what he needs to go and tell them. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. He said to me, Mortal, feed your stomach and fill your belly with this scroll that I give you. I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey. Then he said to me, Mortal, go to the house of Israel and repeat my very words to them. Now we hand this, which means he also told Ezekiel, get some parchment and a stylus and write this down. Because if he had just said this to Ezekiel and he went and talked to the house of Israel, we don't have an account of it. Now, Jesus did not come out of his anguish to make the many righteous through his devotion to God. And that's what this verse says. His anguish ended in death. He asked God on the cross why God had forsaken him and then he died. God's righteous servant is a man of pain, suffering, and wounds throughout his life. Grievously affected especially by disease and severely injured at one time or another as though plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. These are the qualities, if you will, that identify me as God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous. That, in the fact, 
I was supposed to die 20 years ago, but for God removing lung cancer from me, lung cancer that he crushed me with himself. He gave me lung cancer, that he kept me alive, and then he removed it, and now I have long life to accomplish all these tasks before me, the task of Elijah, the task of the prophet like Moses, the task of David, the task of the righteous servant. They all go together. He spent 13 years preparing me. As he said, I don't need four different people, and I don't need to try to train up four different people. You see, he never leaves me. He's never gone. His spirit entered into me. God is in his spirit. They do not leave. He always tells me, if we let you drop dead, and I don't know why that is. He, he won't tell me. You know, he, there's a lot of things he won't tell me, by the way. But um, it's, it's this life that I led that has prepared me for this. I've been down low, and I've been up high, practicing law. Uh, I've been thrown out of schools. I failed ninth grade. Uh, yes, you know, I, I, I've run the gamut with the, and with different peoples, and I've been in poverty for 13 years. We walk all the time. I see who lives out there. I see the people that live on the streets. I talk to them, and um, I was a fighter. I'm sure David was. He doesn't really come across it, but here's a man. When he was in exile, when, when he <laughs> went to the... Uh, Philistines for a couple of years. It said that he went out and killed enemies of God every single day. And then he and, and he killed the women too because they might tell on him. <laughs> now there's a day that you don't usually factor into your thoughts. But the amazing part of that is, the miraculous part is, he's never hurt. Never got hurt. Now, you go jump into a nest of savage men and kill them all, and you do it every day for a year and a half, you figure somewhere along the line you're going to at least get hit in the head with a rock. Something's going to happen. But no, see, God was with him. So he had a fiery nature, and so did Moses. In his anger, he killed the man. Ezekiel, who you never would think of it, he says when God took it, Spirit entered him, God was in him, and God started his fire of refinement. Ezekiel said, I went in bitterness and in the fury of my spirit. So, that's just part of the problem. Now, I don't know about Isaiah. He seems uh, like he didn't have the same type of issues with his uh, furious spirit. And if you go to Ezekiel, God goes out of his way to say, I know that those who do not revere my name, stain my name, have been talking about me, <laughs> and this and that. And he said, and I've heard them. And he said, and I know there's many who do revere and esteem my name, and for this day, I'm preparing a roll of remembrance, scroll of remembrance. And that would be for those who Esteem his name, revere him, which means heed him. And that's what's written into the covenant of Jeremiah 31. But there he said, when I forgive your sins, that will make, of course, Torah written on your heart, which I've explained. That just means a lot of people are going to come back or start into Judaism and put a better effort towards learning the Torah. And, and that's... It's just a metaphor, and that's what it's meant. And he also shows us here that it's not going to be everybody. In the covenant, he says, and all shall heed me. Well, that's what you would expect. You know, or from God's perspective, if I forgive everybody's sin, of course I would expect everybody to heed me. But the fact is, I know better. That's what he would tell you. I know better. I know people. I made people. And you know, there's so many people that will never believe a word I say. There's atheists. There's, you know, there, there, there's religious people, and they are setting their beliefs. Anybody who says 
messianic era isn't going to happen should, you know, uh, not be listening to. <laughs> so those, and so what is he talking about there? He talks about, he says, those who he and revere me will be like uh, calf-fed, uh, stall-fed calves who will, will stomp on the ashes of those who do not heed the Lord. And basically, it's an antiquity where it's, it's verses for antiquity and today. He's basically talking about heaven. And that's something I haven't, I don't believe in all these videos. And of course, this is the last one for Isaiah 53. That, okay, I'm going to go forward first. I think I might run across it here in my notes. Again, I'm reading from my Midrash on Isaiah 53 and from the writings in the two books that God dictated to me. This is how he says it in Malachi. He says, the Lord has not heard it and noted it. And a scroll of remembrance has been written at his behest concerning those who revered the Lord and esteem his name. And on the day that I am preparing, said the Lord of hosts, they shall be my treasured possession. I will be tender toward them as a man is tender toward a son who ministers to him. And he tells me that's his reference. If I'm going to be tender to people, it's going to be in heaven. That's just how I am. And that's what, and, and if you, you love as, you know, as to your son, this and that, you would want them to go to heaven. But that's what it's for. God says that he, he might elaborate on that for me at some future time. But that, that's what it says. A man who is tender towards his son, who ministers to him, is a man who never wants to be without him. He's going to want him with him. And, of course, he dictated that to me like two years ago. <laughs> For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. Now, here's God calling Jerusalem heaven. Okay, why? Because in antiquity, they didn't think about a spiritual heaven. The, the concept of living with the angry God, who's <laughs> always riot, raising the sword against you and the harshness of life, it, 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 you know, that's why they believed in a resurrection. But in Ezekiel, God shows you his spiritual heaven. It's in verses 1 and 10. Now, he also shows you, for, for antiquity, chapter 37, rise, old bones, rise. A resurrection chapter with Ezekiel. But in chapter 1, you see this wheel works. These four wheels that, with wheels in, wheels that can turn by themselves, this and that, and the spirit is in the wheels, it says. And above that, and moving with the wheels are four creatures with six wings. And in chapter 10, he says, oh, it's the same wheel works. It's, it's the same vision, except this time he calls them cherubim, which are the angels that are on the ark. We've all seen a picture of that. For as the new heaven, oh, back to that. How is that a spiritual heaven? It's the eyes. I'm out for a walk. I haven't read chat, uh, Ezekiel yet at this point in time, some, some years back. And God and I have walked up to the city park, to a beautiful park called Memorial Park. And it's got a three-mile running loop, golf course. It's got everything, trees everywhere, paths, railroad trains cross through it. And uh, he had, you know, let me go out there and get some exercise and get out of the house. And so I'm talking to him after I ran, I'm sitting under a tree in some shade, getting some, getting cool. And we were discussing whether or not I was going to jog home from there, another two miles, or, or we were going to walk. We're, you know, we just chit chat. And all of a sudden, I'm in the galaxies. 
It's a vision, but it's so real. I mean, it's like it's actually happening. I'm in the galaxy seeing the most amazing sights I've ever seen in my life. And this is a vision in spirit as opposed to a vision in body where you're in your body. I mean, you recognize yourself. The spirit, you can't see. And I'm looking out, looking out, and all of a sudden I realize there's no legs, no arms. There's nothing there. It's just me, and I felt like a pair of eyes. So that night, he tells me, this is how he taught me. So that night, he says, read uh, Ezekiel 1 and 10. The minute I saw the eyes being gathered into the wheels and on the angels, I said, that's the spirits of the Jewish people. It's going to and fro throughout the land. And then in 10, in 10, these, these cherubim flapping those wings, they're covered with eyes. The wheels are covered with eyes. And they lift up to the, to, to the platform of heaven, to God's house, the east gate of God's house, God's house, heaven. And God is there. <laughs> and there's a vision, a visage of his throne. Okay. It's a spiritual heaven. He's picking up the Jews, the spirits, and taking them up. And, and, and he told me the wheels represents those who died in a diaspora. Whereas the eyes upon the creatures or the cherubim represent those living in Israel. It's just the wheels indicate he had to go get them. That's all. So there's a spiritual heaven, and yet, but it, well, anyway, I'm not going to go back into the resurrection. It's just, uh, you don't want it to happen. It would destroy Israel. What are you going to do with, with the savage slave Israelites? What are you going to do with those people? God says, run. That's what you do. Get out of there. I said, well, why would you send them towards the Palestinians and use them to drive them over to the Jordan where they belong? For as the new heaven and the new earth which I shall make shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. You know what the new heaven is? It's when all these spirits of the Jews rise up and now they're angelic. Now they're angelic. They won't have wings. But you're angels. So God is adding a brand new host of angels to his heaven, the angels Israel. That's what that's all about. He's taking me there in visions. I've been to the very room I'll have. I've seen the meeting rooms, and I've seen the entertainment. Now, you're a different being, and I'll get to that, where he says, you will never remember the things of before, and that before you pray, I will answer. I have the answers to those. And I think that's too detailed for, for, for what I'm doing right here, and I need to move on. But, again, it's the last tape, and I wanted to make sure this was clear. In the scroll of remembrance, that's what's being talked about. Being entered during the day of the Lord, because everybody sinned free. Now, I mean, that's how you know it's going to be different. Because everybody starts even. And now, my job as Elijah and as the righteous servant is... Bring the Jewish families back to the sin of God. Those who are strayed, those who never came, those who have found Jesus in their Judaism. No, 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 no. No Jesus in the Judaism. That doesn't work. That never works. And that's bringing a false God before God's face. And you really, really don't want to do that. Not that there's a, a hell. Judaism doesn't believe in it. Although I have to say, and I've questioned him on this, Isaiah in 64, 65, he's got one heck of an account that sounds like hell to me. But God said, no, nah, that was just for antiquity. I don't have a hell. I don't bother with those kind of things. So there's no worries, but you don't want to miss it. Here's the entertainment. He says, I'm building a new heaven, the angels Israel, a new host, and a new earth. So, I mean, that tells you what we, most of us already know. The judgment day doesn't come until this world's done. And then he's going to, they say, the souls of all men are in God's hand. He's going to raise those angels up then. But the guy being right standing, he, unlike Christians, he, he's not taking murderers and 
wife beaters and child molesters, you know, even though they're sin free. Uh, in Christianity, except Jesus becomes sin free, and it doesn't matter what you've done. You go to Jesus. Well, that's what right standing is about. You know, you've heard me say it on these videos. You've got to be in right standing. I mean, you've got to be a decent person if you're going to be in God's head. But, you know, that's going to, that's going to be an awful lot of people. And uh, he said to wait on that. So, Verse 12. Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his sport. For he exposed himself to death and was numbered among the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for sinners. Okay, if you've watched these videos, you, you already know how this works out. Exposed himself to death. God crushed me with disease. I was exposed to death. He started that tumor by orchestrating me being shot through the abdomen. He, 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 for the longest time, I believe, when they told me, when they, we got that tumor out 20 years later, they said, this tumor's been growing for 20 years. And I backdated it to being just about the year I was gunshot. And I did a lot of research, and I found there are theories, but it's really not proven, that traumatic shock to your internal organs can activate dormant cancer cells. And God says, it is true. But I had to use my power, too. And he said, and again, it's just more suffering. It's more scars and bruises. It's just what your life's been about for what I am giving you. And uh, a greater gift you cannot receive. I think everybody would agree with me on that who believe in God. I don't know about atheists. You couldn't talk to me. If he hadn't literally spoken to me, I don't, I'd have never believed in God. And so, there's a lot of people who said, Keith, do you know how many things you have survived and lived? You know, four times birth, gunshot, colon cancer, lung cancer. <laughs> how can you not believe in God? I said, it just won't come to me. I even told God, and I know how hard all this is to believe, and I'll give you a good example. Two years into this fire refinement, virtually living with God and His Spirit, and all kinds of things happen. And he, he, he kept me almost like on adventures because he can control my perceptions, my judgments. That would be Isaiah chapter 11, I think it's verse 3. He, he, will, not, he will not make judgments and decisions based on what his eyes perceive and his ears hear. See, he does that for me. I, I, again, I don't make any decisions anyway. He controls it all, but there it is in the chapter and a, a better understanding of what that means. And um, <laughs> Carry on? Okay. I don't know where that was going. Somebody needs to... Oh, that's what he's doing. Somebody needs to... To, to contact me someday and say, uh, you know, in this video, you right at the verge of telling me something I wanted to hear. And, and as we, as me and the Spirit call, call it, because it, it happens at the end sometimes too, God just wipes your mind. It's just, you go into basically a state of awareness. I'm just, you know, I'm here and there's nothing happening. Just no, you can't, you can't muster up a thought. You can't even say to yourself, hey, I'm not thinking. You can't even do that. And that has to do with heaven. In heaven, you don't have a mind anymore. Spirit is so complicated. You know, your mind is just a little electricity, chemicals, different tissue of the brain. That's not who you are. That's, that's not where your thoughts are. That's where your thoughts come from. Your spirit is your person. Your spirit reads that stuff in your brain. It reads this information coming in through your eyes and your ears in the forms of electricity, chemicals, and synapses, and <clears throat> things like that. 
and this is going to go back to before you pray, I will answer. In heaven, you become like me. God provides the information of your mind. Okay, but now mine's much more detailed. And, but it's not as detailed as the Holy Spirit. But he's been with me my entire life. And um, so he can provide more knowledge of me um, than he does all the, you know, seven, 14 million Jews in the world, whatever the number is. I know there's about 7 million in Israel and 7 million in America, but I don't know how many are in Europe or, or this or that. And um, he is. And, he's, and so I... I, he is proving to me that here on the earth, what it's like not to have your mind in heaven. And he can do it. And he can do it with all the angels. Now, there's a process to it, and it's, it gets a little bit more complicated. But this is for the Jews. This is what he's doing. It's not the Messianic age of the world to come. It's just simply not. And I've tried to explain that as, as best I can with him leading me on the way. He's leading me in all these videos. And he, you know, I have it all, my writings down. He tells me, okay, go, go here, go there, pace that. <laughs> now, okay, now let's, let's do a recording. And so, you know, I'm just a servant. It's just like, okay. Yeah, that's what I say all the time. Okay. Okay. And sometimes I'm trying to say, okay, and he's already lifted me up, and I'm walking to go do what he wants, and I don't even know what it is yet. That's how much he can control me. <laughs> he, doesn't even have to, he doesn't have to tell me anything. I'll just go do it. That's the kind of control I'm talking about. But he can be your mind. And that's why before you pray, he can answer. It's because he's the one putting it into your mind to think, I'm going to pray. <laughs> so he already knows. But it's, it's real complicated, but uh, as you might imagine. But he can do it. As many people as he can get into that scroll for a special heaven. Because heaven is so much of the mind. It's like the realest vision you could ever have. And, I, and now he, I got that finished. He's picking back up with the entertainment in heaven. <laughs> He's building a new world. He told me, he says, I'm in this room. He's got a bed, a table, a lamp. It's real, real sparse, kind of like where Elijah stayed at one time uh, in his stories. He says, go to that bay window. And a bay window is, you know, you have a square room, but it, 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 it put, it's, it's outside of the room. It's like, a, it's like a porch, but, you know, it's got uh, glass all around it. But you can see out. He says, look down. And I looked down, and I saw the earth in chaos. Just like reading Genesis. He is starting it up. That's it. And in heaven, you know, everything's different. You're a different creature, but you're you. And the, the whole idea of what it means with you won't remember the things of before. God says, look, the Holocaust people don't want to remember the Holocaust. I said, well, how are they going to, you're building a Jewish heaven. How is everybody going to know they're Jews if they don't remember being a Jew in heaven? And then he showed me how. And you won't wonder, why do I know all these things about Jewish people and myself as a Jew? And that'll be it. He won't let you wonder. Your mind just goes to another, to something else. He says, I'll take care of that. That's easy. He's so funny. Okay, my camera stops at a half an hour, so picking back up. I was talking about the world. God's going to choose the people again. He's going to basically do the same thing. They won't necessarily be called Hebrews and Jews, and you'll have different characters and names, but you're going to see how the history of the Jews played out. And of course, you see the creation of the first human beings what the people were really like at this time. And uh, it's going to be really interesting, really interesting. And uh, and that, like I said, there's meeting places. And so, here, here, you know, God gave me an amendment, be mindful, which uh, is for everybody to decide and be debated by the leaders of the 
different Jewish religious movements, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform. I don't know if they'll ever win. <laughs> but uh, they don't believe in the coming of the Moshiach. I don't even think Conservative does. And uh, they're wrong. They're wrong. But uh, everybody's wrong about when he comes, there's going to be a Messianic era. Not as it's, it's taught, what you have is the day of the Lord, the times of the Messiah, the anointed one, in the awesome, fearful time of the Lord. And we're going to keep writing. Once once this thing busts open, and I'm just going to assume God will, God knows what he's doing, and we're going to end up there, uh, and I'll continue to write books of, you know, maturing, aging, uh, even more, and... <laughs> And, uh, you know, dealings with the government and uh, helping out here and there. It says that uh, these nations are startled and kings who are silent. I think it's, I, I'm not sure if it's chapter 11, but they're going to they're gonna start coming to me for, to, to, for answers. Like, kind of like a Solomon, knowing that it's not me, Keith McCarty, but actually coming to the belief that, in fact, the God of humanity, but who is, has chosen the Jews as his, uh, is with me. I mean, that, that's, that's, it's not I have to pray to him or anything. He's within me. Now, he's without me, too. But, you know, from my perspective, he's just in me with, with his spirit. There's the three of us. It's a man and divine beings, which God withheld from the Torah. He didn't want you to know. It's my proof. Just to have this knowledge and to be able to point to so many different places in the Hebrew Bible and say, well, look, that's what this means. And nobody nobody even knew what it was to question it. And this is how he, you know, back in biblical times, he communicated and had this book, his book, the one the Christians took from him, told you you don't know how to read it, that you don't see the prophecy of Jesus Christ and human sacrifice and his description in Isaiah 53. This man of suffering who's a kind of plague, smitten and afflicted. Where? You know, I, I was on the internet reading articles at one time and I saw an, uh, a writing by a uh, Catholic of the cloth. And he said, well, we know that he doesn't fit every verse, but who else can it be? I said, I said what's with these people? Because this is a description. You got to match all the verses, or you're not him. You know, religious. You know, you get this belief, and then that's it. And common sense, reason, and your intelligence don't get in the way. And I guess that's what belief is. You know, <laughs> God wanted me to be an atheist, by the way, and not very much of a religious person. Um, and like in heaven, he, he can form your thoughts. You, you'll, you'll still feel like it's you thinking. But there's so much to that. You know, it's taken me 13 years to get to as accomplished at it as I am. And just being around people, I've always been pretty much of a loner. But, you know, in this, this role, uh, and I, I feel like I'm more than ready for it. I'm going to have to be around people. I'm going to have to speak in front of, of groups, large groups of people. Not used to that. Uh, even this is, you know, talking on a camera and posting it to the uh, to YouTube. That's really doesn't bother me at all. He he has shaped my emotions and calmed and tempered them in in the real by wounding and crushing and bruising and punishment and maltreatment, but more so in his power. Um, it's an incredible feeling. I mean, I can feel it going through me. I can feel it like a pillow when I'm angry, just whoo, just the anger just goes away, you know. And, he, and listen, God can make you angry. Now I mentioned I've begged for death a thousand times and I cursed him a thousand times. I promise you, he can get anybody to curse him. It doesn't take, it doesn't take long at all. And he can control your thoughts anyway. He can make you curse him just to make you feel bad. I mean, anyway. Verse 12. Anyway, there, there's an entertainment meeting. Uh, it's Jewish heaven. And, and, and what he's going to keep your mind focused on is Judaism. I know this, this is my other hook in the water. I got an amendment to be mindful. So 
to tell people you don't have to be quite so fanatical. If you had to go to work on Saturday, but you've been doing everything, you're reading, you're doing Shabbat, you're not working on Saturday, you're following the oral tradition for all these things, that suddenly, this, this would be my, this is what I would say if I was on a panel debating this with the other religious movements. I would say, it would be okay for me to go to work, but immediately, I need to find another job. Because God knows I'm being observant. But he also knows, you know, I have children, I have a house note, I have car notes. You know, I can't just lose my job at, at a whim. And he would understand. That, that's what you got to do. I mean, you just got to say, he would understand. I am being more than mindful. That would be my idea. But it's for everybody to decide of themselves. You know, he clean, you know, he, everybody's forgiven. you got to clean slate. And as Elijah, I'm supposed to recounsel the, the Jewish families back to Judaism. And that's what I'm doing in, in these videos and in the books. Come back. Respect God. He doesn't remember anything you've ever done before that's wrong. Don't let, as Judaism teaches, the evil inclination get hold of you. I don't know if there's some reason make me laugh. And, uh, and uh, you know, practice Judaism. Come back. He's here. And, and look at the proof that you have. You have a Moses in your midst. Because I can't know these things. My words have to be true. And lurking behind all that, hopefully people say, okay, I'm going to just take a chance on this and, and try to believe. Oh, that's my other story I left out. I'm all over the place today. Anyway, come back to Judaism. Keep your slate clean. Get into the scroll of remembrance. Be in right standing. And uh, uh, for the rabbis, that means you got to correct your teachings on the Messianic era. Read the books that God had me type. Start teaching the matters in it and the things that you hear on these videos about, about how God communicates with the world. He's in his spirit. A man in divine beings. He's not an angel. Uh, it's a man with a task. It can be limited or it can be great. You know, Moses, great. My task, great. You know, it's just all encompassing until I die. They're not going to leave me. If you ever see me, you can hit, you can bump your friend and say, hey, I know where God is. He'll say, what are you talking about? I know where God is. Where's God? <laughs> see that guy over there? He's all around him. Wherever he goes, God goes. Wherever Moses went, God did. That's how he walked amongst the tents of the Israelites. <laughs> you know, it was Moses walking by. The God's spirit was in him, and God's in the spirit, and he's sitting there talking to Moses. We need to check these guys out in this tent. We need to talk to the leader of this group. Let's go over here. And, you know, it was Moses, you just, his whole, he, I, there's no reason for me to believe it's any different for him than me. And, um, it's an incredible thing. You know, and Isaiah went through. Look at the book he wrote. It is not easy working for God. He, as I mentioned, <laughs> my first draft of Isaiah 53, he irritated me so bad. Things, just little things. You know, uh, I would delete those five pages. <laughs> I said, I worked two days on those five pages. He said, yeah, I know, but I decided I don't want them. Anyway, I ended up trying to throw the computer out of the window. <laughs> I didn't really want to, but I was so mad. I think I would have even let me, but my arms wouldn't move. <laughs> the power he had all around me and through me. But um, I think that I think that's right to the on things I've been talking about. Verse 12, Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion, for he exposed himself to death. And again, you know, I had the cancer. He was behind it. He crushed me with cancer. I had bullet wounds. And so my portion is the many. And that means the people who made righteous are going to follow me because he's going to appoint me a ruler amongst the flock. And then they become a multitude. And I hope it's a lot more. I, I hope it's the largest multitude anybody ever saw. I hope somebody says, that's not a multitude. That's a mob. <laughs> that's, you know, whatever it turns out to be. And I hope to make a living this way. Writing and um, uh, speaking. 
synagogues, seminars, uh, groups, just groups in general, big groups, small groups, you know, just say donate what you can or what you will, what you feel good about. We need it. Um, <laughs> anyway, this, this we. How, how am I going to get God to Israel if I don't get money? If I don't get these books published? And I tell you, I joke about it. And, you know, I'll get a series of cancer. God, listen, I know you want to be in Israel. I know you're tired of Texas. I said, and just as soon as I can get some money, I'm going to take you there. <laughs> it makes the spirit laugh. He's always making me laugh. Yeah, I said, I'll take you there. I'll get you there, God. It's okay. I said, now, now we could we could take the fast forward on that and go to Vegas. What do you say? <laughs> he said, you know, I won't do something like that. I said, come on, it's just a roulette ball. Freeze it. You know, let's play a little blackjack. You know, tell me what the other cards are. We'll clean up. We'll be in Israel overnight. He said, Keith? <laughs> anyway, he won't do things like that. <laughs> That's him making faces with my head my eye. I don't even know what they're doing. So those are the witnesses. They're the many and the multitude, and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, followers. Not, not necessarily on social media, but then I exposed myself to death and disease and almost died from the blood wound and should have. He kept me alive. You know, I, I said I did. I was holding on. No, he wasn't going to let me. He wasn't going to let me go. But it was, you know, I didn't know him at the time. And it, it was a brutal experience. I, get, I was 18. Numbered among the sinners. Oh, I've already gone over that. The, the, the Christians say, oh, that doesn't mean he was a sinner. He's the unblemished lamb of God. That's because he got crucified with a man to his left who was a sinner and a man to the right who was a sinner. So therefore, he's kind of a sinner. One, two, three. <laughs> they don't say one, two, three. I bet. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying. The man's a sinner. And so, having gone through all these verses, I have shown that he doesn't fit one of them. Not one. He doesn't fit them. It's not an end of suffering. He wept one time. And he suffered one day. And it was a big suffering, I'll give you that. But I mean, yeah. That's not a life that, it's not descriptive. Thousands upon thousands of people were being scourged and, and, and crucified. They didn't tell you anything. These verses are to identify a person. Crushed with cancer, exposed to death. Jesus wasn't exposed to death. He died. Exposure is you got real close to it. That's not him. And <laughs> anyway. And be, you know, the man is believed in human sacrifice. I, I can't get off this. I mean, at least they got it. You offer the sacrifice to God hoping to get favor. What favor does he want from the Gentiles? When he offers his son up, what is the favor to him? He got nothing out of the deal. You don't know God. You think he's going to do a deal and not come out on top. God has to come out on top in everything. Jewish people, I know you say you can argue with him because Abraham did. Yeah, go ahead. You can argue with him until you're blue in the face. You're never going to win. There's no winning. I asked him, I said, why don't we play a game of chess or something? Like, he said, he said Kia, couldn't I, I, I beat you in like three moves every time. It's just nine playing. I said, well, why don't you just kind of like let me win? He said, and the spirit started laughing. He said, that'll never happen. <laughs> His caricature that he puts into my mind, and this is all explained in the books, of course, these visuals. You know, I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm like a walking... Visionary, but it's not of the future. There's just always pictures when we, and, and I can do it to them. I can, I can be trying to think of a store I want to go to, and I can't remember the name, and I just picture it in my mind, and boom, they got it. <laughs> so it's just a way of communicating. My communicate, yeah, you know, but that's good. If I was ever in negotiations with Middle East countries, or I'm dealing with kings, as it says in the scripture, I will that they'll come to me. And we're trying to get things straight. And, you know, who knows where the world's headed? Um, they'll be right there. I'll say everything perfectly right for the people in the room and the people before me. Just what needs to be said. The perfect thing. Because he's perfect. 
and he can have me do and say anything he wants after training me up like this. You know, it's funny too because I know I've I've hit uh, on uh, Miss Rabbi Toby a singer a little bit because I, I'm really upset with the way, because of his Isaiah 53 and because it's such a hindrance to myself, God, and spirit to have all the Jewish people believe it can only be Israel the Jewish people and. Uh, and I know he's really reaching, I bet he knows he's really reaching on some of that, but it's worth it as an anti-missionary to fight Christianity, to bring Jews back to him. And I know that's what he's doing, that's fine. Like I said, I'm sure I'd like him, he's very personable, but, you know, God has me say things as he will have me say them. And what, what a great assist he would be for God in this thing. He's got a radio show. He's got all those followers. He's he's got a nice setup for doing YouTube. <laughs> you know, I'm in this 40 year old room that I call the adjunct of the holies of holies. <laughs> and there's paint peeling everywhere. And the pipes are shot. <laughs> yeah, this is the holy holies I'm talking from right here. The adjunct. It's not the not the original one, but. Uh, Intercession for the sinners. I don't, there's, all this I've pretty much covered, but I do have something to say about Jesus on this other than he doesn't, he doesn't fit in the verses in, in my video as far as I'm concerned, except this one. It's the sinner. It's the sinner. Jesus is said to be without sin. That he was crucified with the sinner on his left and on his right and counted as one of them. Jesus may have looked and been thought of as a sinner for being among them, but he was still said to be sinless. Appearing to be a sinner is not the same as being a sinner. Being said to be Unblemished and sinless is not the same as being unblemished and sinless. If somebody saying you are doesn't make it so. And the scripture will tell us contrary. I've already given the biggest example. All the prophets say of me, I shall ride this ass. And the prophecy is referring to Zechariah. Pretty sure it's in Zechariah where uh, Moshe, or the anointed one, he rides an ass in and he defeats Rome which is what would have happened in Jesus' time, and he's uh, appointed king, basically, of the world. Okay. Defeating Rome and being appointed king is the furthest thing from being spit on, mocked, scourged, crucified, and raised in on the third day. <laughs> I guess raised on the third day would be good. I think it's just a story. But, um, they had Egyptian gods, and pharaohs, and Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. What people believe in antiquity, you can go to the History Channel or Google it. I found it. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Good example of Jesus lying, being deceitful. Jesus changed, verse 10, from defeating Rome to being executed by him. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, fair Zion, raise a shout. Fair Jerusalem, lo, your king, the descendant of David, chapter 11, is coming to you. He is victorious, triumphant, yet humble, riding on an ass, on a donkey fouled by a she-ass. Now, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm not going to ride an ass in to fulfill and fit this verse. The fact is, I am a humble man. I'm not humble like Moses. But God says you never know at the end of your life what you might be. He's still working on me. I need to keep working, baby. <laughs> this is the Holy Spirit. He can He can talk to me through me too. And you know, He and God, they're so close, so to speak. These two clouds, these different elements, and he, God created Him, and whatever He wants, whatever picture he wants in my mind. See, he doesn't have power. These angels don't have power. God's the only power in the universe. And 
Yeah, he doesn't make an angel that's got power. He said, why would I do that? He said, I got to keep an eye on him anyway. I'll do the power. That's why he killed the firstborn of all of Egypt. It's not the angel of death. He, I said, you pinned it on somebody else's what you did when you wrote it up. You know what he did? He told he told the spirit, he told the angel, hey, today I got to go down and uh, kill all the firstborn in Egypt to, so I can get my people out. It is real life. And, and he said, today, your name is angel of death. And I'll tell you, it would have tickled him to no end. His personality. I mean, he's... He was just going, oh, right, angel, I'm an angel of death. <laughs> he does that just to be funny. I, I'm sure he's regal and statuesque and holy and everything else when he's not around me. <laughs> but these kind of things make me laugh, and they live with me. So anyway, I, I do that a lot. <laughs> oh, man, I don't want to do that. This is an old Texas line. This is a cowboy thing. So here's 10. He shall banish chariots from Ephraim. That's the northern kingdom. It's had three names. Israel, Ephraim, and uh, um, the other name. And horses from Jerusalem. The warrior's bow shall be banished. He shall call on the nations to surrender. Jesus is supposed to ride that ass into there. And, and, and calling the nations, the Middle East, to surrender. He's <laughs> and his rule shall extend from sea to sea and ocean to lands in Zechariah chapter 9, 9 and 10. Now, he's one of these prophets. All the prophets say of me, when I ride this ass in, I get crucified. Can you find a bigger lie, a bigger deceit? No, you can't. You know why? Because you know how many billions of people have have been deceived by that? Because they don't read the they, they don't go look for see what Zechariah said. Jesus says all the prophets said of him, that's good enough for them. They don't have to check it out. But in this age of information, the internet, God would beg to disagree. <laughs> yes, you do. And when you find out what you've been reading, you find all this lies and deceit of the most deceitful book ever written. Same, on the same basis. Billions. There's two billions of Christians right now believing all this. This human sacrifice, you know, God's appalled at that. <laughs> he said, I'm making a human sacrifice. What are they going to give me? Why would I do it? And they're going to accept human sacrifice. That's the Jews. They know better than that. And he, he told his people, don't sacrifice your children. Now, he's going to give laws and commandments to the Jews and then go do it himself? I don't think so. They just don't know who he is. You know, he might have to go back to the Israelites in the biblical times to get a good handle on it. But I do know the Israelites went up to Moses, or one of them did, and said, Moses, Moses, you go talk to him and come tell us what he says. We're all going to die. <laughs> they were in fear. That's how people were about God. This concept that he's making, I, I don't know. You now, Christians were like mans and made their own human sacrifices of their fellow Christians. Now, that I can kind of understand. If, they, if their theology was, if we kill one of ours, then God will look favorably and forgive our sins. That makes more sense than God killed his kids so you can sin. <laughs> and people are giving up and go to heaven. Well, heaven's just for the Jews, Christian. I'm going to I'm going to say it one more time. If you want to see heaven, Christians, you're going to have to convert to Judaism, be a good observant Jew. you got to become a Jew. I'm saying it like that to irritate you. There's a whole lot of people who, who hit the thumbnails for my video, and they don't last a minute. <laughs> I figure 98% of the people are not Jewish. Only 2% are. There's some that hang in there and, and watch them all. I'm getting a great response. But uh, uh, Christians don't last long at all, I don't think. I don't know that to be a fact. I haven't done a survey or a study yet. So, this is what he said. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. Luke says, he said this, 
This is in chapter 31 of, I don't really have much else to say on 12. I'm going to finish with Jesus here. It's 18, Luke chapter 18, verse 31 through 33. Then he, Jesus, took unto him the 12 and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and all things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. That's just a term for your human being born of humans. <laughs> Son of Man. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked, spitefully entreated. He's speaking in the third person. And they shall scourge him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again. Jesus says all things written by the prophets concerning him are accomplished by his writing and essence in Jerusalem to be delivered to the Gentiles, put to death. No prophet of the Hebrew Bible wrote this. This is not what Zechariah said. The Hebrew Bible, great scroll of Isaiah, the Apocrypha, that's what I was looking for, and the Pseudepigrapha, of all the possible scripture that Jesus could be referencing and not one book mentions a son of man, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, a son of God, a man who is God, or any man to be delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, and put to death, a man who dies for the sins of other men, any man who is to rise from the dead on the third day, or a man who is sacrificed or made to, sacri made to sacrifice himself by God. It's just a big lie. And a manipulation of Hebrew scripture. And I pointed out another one earlier. The book of Hebrews says that when Israel violated his covenant, including Moses, that he abandoned them. So what it says? He married them. I espoused them. Huh. Selective reading by religious people. What are you going to do? Malachi. This is more deceit. If he's under deceit, better than lie for Jesus. Malachi 1. Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. Jesus uses Malachi 3 1 that I just read. To describe his cousin John the Baptist to be Elijah, but leaves out the angel of the covenant. This, is, uh, this won't take long. It'll take me longer to splice and snip and do all the things you got to do to put these things together. So J Jesus uses Malachi 3 1 to describe his cousin John the Baptist to be Elijah, but leaves out the angel of the covenant. Sin forgiveness for the Jewish people. There are only two specific covenants, and anyway, I've gone through all that. It's clearly, the angel has the new covenant, David covenant of friendship. You know, God says, I'm going to grant it when David's here, and I'm going to appoint him to be a ruler amongst the flock. So you would imagine David is the one that delivers that. My appearance being Elijah, David, prophet like Moses, righteous servant, and Elijah is the messenger of the new covenant, David, the deliverer, let you know about God's granting the covenant of friendship. So one man, one man fulfills the remaining, the, the, uh, the prophecies of God that have not been fulfilled in the day of the Lord. He's finishing up the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible with one man. Yeah, all they needed was Moses. I know he used Aaron too, it's particularly early on. But uh, it was pretty much Moses. Pretty much Moses. Um, you know, Aaron was to be a pro likened to a prophet to Moses, with Moses being God, you know, symbolically speaking. And God was actually speaking to him, to Aaron. And on and on and on. This kind of Torah stuff, I leave that alone. Stay away from that. Halakha, I stay away from it. Uh, oral tradition, stay away from it. But that has nothing to do with the end times. 
and the, what the prophets are saying. Now I know, you know, except you know, unless you go with the prophecies of the Messianic era, and I think a lot of that really is found in the prophets. Anyway, back to this: this John the Baptist was Elijah. Okay, it wasn't a time for the new covenant. Elijah's not supposed to be there. God's not going to be returning to his temple. He's the temple hadn't been destroyed. He's not going to be returning to it. He's in it. They, it, Jesus declares the day of the Lord, but it can't be. It doesn't fit Malachi 3 at all. Jesus said, this is he, John the Baptist, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my missionary before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Again, I think he's speaking to the third person, but that's Jesus. Jesus is saying that John was clearing the way for Jesus as the Lord, as the Son of God, or God incarnate, and as renowned teacher of the scripture at synagogues as a young boy, Jesus knew that the Jewish people were without sin if John was Elijah. That is why he did not mention the angel of the covenant. These are the words God dictated to me. He cannot die for the sins of the Jewish people if they are sin free. God forgives sin by his written word, not human sacrifice. And here's the big one. In Jeremiah 38, chapter 31, verse 38, where it talks about see a time is coming, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. The last sentence is, they shall never be uprooted, overthrown, and uprooted again. Never defeated and dispersed again. That's why it's so important to avoid utter destruction. And what he's saying is if you don't do this, they're going to get you eventually. I'm telling you, if I put my sanctuary amongst you, you're going to be, look at the covenant of friendship, you'll see. You're going to be free of taunts. You're going you're gonna to be secure. You're going to be safe. You're never, you, and basically says the same thing, you're never going to be dispersed again. So, if Elijah's there, and he and he's supposed to have the covenant, it means it's the day of the Lord, and the Jews will never be defeated again. Well, what happened? Well, you had three revolts by the Jews against Rome some 40 years later in 70 common era, and that, that's when the temple was destroyed. That was the, with the first revolt. There was two more after that. 50,000 were murdered and crucified and killed with swords and arrows uh, in the first revolt. It was huge. And, uh, but, but Rome won. And the Jews were dispersed. That's where the diaspora started. And that's what God had Jeremiah writing for when he said, write this down. Get some parchment and stylus. Write this down. See, your time is coming. You know, he told the Jews, I'm going to redeem you. I've got a day. i got a guy. And I, I'm going to have a guy again. See, right here, it's 53. i got a guy. It's got a crazy description on it. It's, it's, it's going to do all kinds of things. And it, Isaiah couldn't have written it unless God told him, okay, now, now I want this. Here's, here's verse 5. Here's verse 10. Right? Okay, right there. You know, they're probably going back and forth. But Isaiah may have even said, well, how about this? And, you know, he, <laughs> God, God would listen to him. And then God said, okay, now write what I said to write. That's pretty much how it goes. Okay. So anyway, John the Baptist can't be Elijah. Period. Jesus doesn't mention the angel of the new covenant. He knows full well the Jews are forgiven the sin. He knows full well. He can't not know, especially if he's God incarnate or this great mind that can go to the synagogues and teach the rabbis when you're 12 years old. Don't tell me I figured out something Jesus couldn't. It's, it's tough enough to think that someone out there is going to say, well, he's just, he's just super smart. Really? I'm smarter than your greatest sages and rabbis? I don't think so. I've never been considered. I'm, I'm a smart guy, but I've got to work at it. Like, if I'm getting ready for a big test, i got to write it. i got to make a summary of everything I'm learning. It's the only way to make it stick in my head. You know, I'm not an intellectual, but I'm, like I said, I'm a lawyer. I did real well in the bar. I'm good at reading and comprehension. But I don't understand radio signals. I don't understand satellites. I don't understand TV. 
<laughs> it just, I'll read it and say, okay, that happens, I don't get it. It just won't sink in, and that's the one I let the, as far as believing, and again, at this long time, but even this, the great belief the Jewish people have that God's actually going to do what he says, and it's, but it's not familiar to you. It's not what you're expecting. But I told him after two years, we're out walking, and this and that's going on. And I said, you know, I know you God. I feel your power. I see you teaching me things I'd have never known. But I still can't believe you exist. It just won't sink in. I can't believe this is God. I can't believe this entity, this, this, this living being with this power and absolute knowledge and what he can do with my body and my mind. It's just, it's, it's beyond comprehension. It's inconceivable. <laughs> Holy Spirit loves me. This is a guy in some pirate show, I think it is. Inconceivable. <laughs> He's got what he's saying. Anyway, I think I'm done. Now here it is. Here, here's, here's where Jerusalem's supposed to be built. This is my closing words on Isaiah 53. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate, and the measuring line shall go straight out to the Garib Hill, and then turn toward Goa, and the entire valley of the corpses and ashes, and all the fields as far as the Wadi Kidron, and the corner of the horse gate, and <laughs> these shall be holy to the Lord. They shall never again be uprooted or overthrown. In my job as an oil, gas, and mineral law <clears throat> specialist, I would have to, to get uh, deeds from 200 years ago and have to figure out things like, it's it, beginning at the third stone by the big elm tree, <laughs> which of course is long gone. And, you know, this is kind of like that, but, but God and I went through it as best we could, and, and he assures me Jerusalem is much bigger than the Jerusalem of antiquity that this is referring to. So, let's get a temple built, and let's never see the Jews defeated and dispersed again. Thank you for listening to all this, and, and uh, this is my Midrash on 53. Uh, there's actually more to it, and there's a lot of other things, which I believe we're going to be putting on YouTube here in the future uh, that's not focused in on 53, but still, it's about the Bible. It's just different things we can still talk about.